All right, well, good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing? Good? You know what, I feel, I'm gonna stand down here with you guys. All right, let's, um, yeah, so as Luke was talking about, and this table is gonna be in charge of keeping me on time. All right, so keep me honest. Um, all right, so, First of all, um, thanks very much to Red Hat for the invite to come and speak with you uh, this morning. I appreciate that very much. Um, what I'm going to share with you is you, what your peers across Canada, um, what they're doing uh, within their IT operations in order to be able to deal with what Luke was talking about, which is uh, digital transformation. So what we do at IDC is we talk to the largest of Canadian organizations and the smallest um, from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, and then all industry verticals as well so that we can figure out what our IT department's doing well and maybe what's not going so well and how can we learn from those mistakes and what are some of the best practices uh, that we can bring to bear as these industries fundamentally get reshaped. Right? Because that's what digital transformation is about. It's about this micro level change that's coming to all of us, right? As consumers, as we deal with our government, as we deal with healthcare and the transportation networks and all the other things that we do as consumers, right? We're buying things from online retailers or doing all the different things that we do. Digital transformation is impacting every one of those little tasks and workflow and processes. But similarly, as employees, employees in retail, employees on the manufacturing floor, or, you know, healthcare practitioners, whatever that looks like, it's impacting that as well. So we've kind of got this micro level impact, but then we've got this macro level impact where entire industries are being fundamentally um, transformed uh, and recreated into something else. In fact, you see literally protests now in Canada uh, over Uber, right? You've seen them in Montreal, we've seen them in Toronto, and we've seen them in other places across the country. Um, and really, that's just the canary in the coal mine. There is no industry in this country uh, that is immune from what's happening, that Uberification, if you will, of the transportation industry. We see the same thing happening to the hospitality industry. Uh, we see the same thing happening in finance. Uh, we see the same thing happening in healthcare. You name your industry, and all of them have this similar type of approach that's happening. The first thing that winds up happening to the industry, and we're really not today going to talk about business models. What we're going to talk about instead is what we need to do as IT in order to be able to catch up to those changes that are happening uh, with respect to the business models. Um, but one of the things that's happening is that you see this kind of hollowing out of the mushy middle within industries. Right? So you see this very large, high volume end of an industry, and that's kind of the Uber effect. And then you've got the high end of an industry, so you'll have this high margin end. So imagine that would be your limousines and what have you. And then all the taxi companies get kind of crushed in the middle. <laughs> Well, there's no industry, again, that's immune to that. So what we need to be able to do in IT is react more quickly to given changes. So if the line of business says, oh, I need to be able to launch this big data project or whatever that might look like, then we can go ahead and do that, right? Um, so when we ask Canadian execs, well, what do you think? Do you think this is real? Do you think this is actually happening in Canada? Um, and uh, by and large, they're saying, yeah, yeah, we think it is. We think the technology is providing us an opportunity. We also think the technology is disrupting our industry or starting to. The, the, the six out of 10, I'll be honest, worried me a little bit. Um, it should be 10 out of 10 that say that, um, that uh, digital transformation, which is the combination, as Luke was describing, of mobility plus cloud plus big data plus um, you know social plus IOT so it's, it's a combination of those things it's not one of those things individually but those things combined together that really winds up creating this effect that we see in in our industries so we simultaneously have um, this change that's happening within IT of massive amounts um, of, of new uh, data that's being created of new devices that, that we need to deal with as well so we've got this sort of new stuff that's coming uh, uh, by the way of digital transformation, but then we have a lot of change coming with the old stuff as well. 
right, as that continues to grow. What's really interesting, though, is that as Canadian organizations, we have access to this. So we have access, for example, to 3.8 billion devices on planet Earth. So it's not just about, sometimes people say, well, oh, the Canadian environment is becoming more competitive. Well, for sure it is, and we do have global companies continuing to, uh, to, to come into Canada and expand, and that's, that's good for our economy and everything. Um, but we as, you know, also have that ability to reach out uh, to these devices as well. So that's 3.8 billion devices now on planet Earth that we can start to have access to. Uh, and depending on your business model, it may be relevant, it may not be, but uh, it still gives us that access to, uh, to a far greater environment. One of the things I did want to do before we kind of get into, okay, what are some of the things that IT departments are doing and how are they reacting to this, is a little bit of a side trip um, into what's happened from an open source standpoint. Um, in part, we're at a Red Hat conference, but also just, it's interesting when we look back at what happened historically in our marketplace and look at where innovation has come from. And when we think about innovation on the third platform, it's being driven by open source. And so we saw back initially with, with the initial web, web 1.0, Right? That was driven by Apache, and then it was driven on top of that by PHP and by Linux, by MySQL, etc. But really, that initial drive into the web was, was driven by open source. Then we had this move into um, areas like uh, the database, and we also had push into uh, the developer environment changing with Java and with Eclipse and, and the, the tools that, uh, that were open sourced around that. And then we looked at you know, Android uh, democratizing the mobile environment. And then we looked at um, you know, the, the, uh, the cloud environment getting fundamentally reshaped and pushed by OpenStack, by Linux, by Docker. Um, and now one of the things that I wanted to talk about uh, around the DevOps side uh, a little bit is there are dozens of open source tools um, depending on whatever the use case is or the requirements across the systems development life cycle, um, if, if one still uses the SDLC, um, that will help us in, in many different ways. Right? And so that's driving, again, driving that innovation. Just like big data, we wouldn't have big data if it wasn't for Hadoop and Spark and Flink and all the NoSQL variants, which again are all from the world of open source. So it's really interesting to see how much open source has driven innovation. It's because it's community driven and that really has lifted things off. Okay, so back home home, um, when we look at what, uh, the amount of change that we're seeing in 2016, and by the way, 2016 in Canada um, is a year of many different inflection points. It's inflection points in Quebec as well. I mean, the amount of data center activity that I'm seeing in this province is incredible, from you know, Ramuski to Sherbrooke, here in Montreal to Quebec City, etc. Tons of activity happening. And a lot of that is to be able to respond to this, which is one of the inflection points we have in the Canadian marketplace, which is that we now spend, as Canadian consumers, uh, as Quebecers, we spend more on technology than we do uh, on our own clothing. Right? And it's the very first time in our history as Canadians that that, that that is true. But it shows how enveloped we are within the technology that we have compared to what we have been in the past. Right? Just how much um, that's become a part of the workflow that we do as Consumers, again, interacting with the government, the healthcare system, transportation networks, education, what have you, or buying things as retailers. Um, but again, as employees as well, how much, again, that's really just become a part of what we do. We can see it in Starbucks, who now in Canada runs 20% of the sales through a mobile device. That's an incredible amount of activity. We see it in the, uh, in the weather network, where I can get right down to my postal code level to this hotel. I can see, you know, is it going to rain here versus in another part of Montreal? Um, which is perfect from you know if you're a runner, but it's also perfect if you're a restaurant and you have a patio and you want to find out you know what, what might the traffic be like into your specific spot, um, and that's a combination of cloud plus big data plus mobile, adding those things together, which then give you the benefit of the third platform all combined, uh, and so they've been able to do some really good work with that. What we're also seeing, though, simultaneously is this um, movement towards a platform. So, whereas before we saw things, you know, kind of this uh, Web 1.0 way, everything was exposed in HTML, and then we saw kind of this Web 2.0, which was this mashups and um, being able to bring together different services. Um, now, what we're seeing is uh, being able to expose what we have, and this is in particular for larger organizations, expose what we have by way of open APIs that allow for uh, the creation of uh, the skinning of our website, all the way to being able to use open data in more unique and interesting 
interesting ways and to allow an ecosystem to develop around what we're doing. Again, it's more part and parcel of what the Quebec government might be looking at or larger organizations, but it impacts smaller organizations as well so far as the available microservices that they can be able to access and how they access them. And we can see that when we look at the amount of cloud that's happening in Canada and how much cloud has changed in this country in such a short period of time. We've gone from being very software as a service centric as a country to being a country that's about platform as a service and about infrastructure as a service. So those have become key elements of what we're doing uh, here in Canada. And so as we look at not just using SaaS but using PaaS and IaaS and that significant growth, what happens is it winds up not just being about this just a bunch of clouds, but it winds up being about extending the architecture of our organization into, into those different environments. So things like federated identity or you know, the change management practices that we have and all the different things that we do on-prem wind up extending out into those environments. So it becomes important to start to look at what that architecture is gonna, gonna, gonna look like. In particular in Canada around big data, um, we, by the way, see a doubling, uh, again, I mentioned 2016 is a big year for change here in Canada. Well, big data is one of those areas. We actually see a doubling in the number of projects this year alone here in this country. Um, and advanced analytics being used over a PaaS environment is one of the key areas where we see growth occurring. But it's kind of like, you know, when I think about the architecture of the future, I sometimes think of, a, a, of an analogy where, you know, I've got my mobile phone and I download an application onto that phone. And some of the application logic is on the phone, some of the information is on the phone. Some of it's with a provider, some of it may be stored up with iCloud or whatever the service is, some of it may be on my local PC. But there's an inherent architecture that I download with that application. What we need to be doing is um, establishing what that architecture will look like from our perspective. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because there's a number of different areas to consider as we start to extend our organization out from what we currently do um, into, this, uh, into this extended type of environment. Um, uh, again, and we've really warmed up to it. Part of the reason is that um there are a lot more data centers here in Quebec. There's more data centers coming across the country as well, although Quebec really is a, is a uh, center point for the activity uh, from a data center perspective. Uh, and being very data, resident, uh, data residency conscious as a country, um, you know, as these data centers have popped up here, we've really become more custom and uh, 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 we appreciate using PaaS and IS far more than we have in the past. So we asked organizations about, um, about another aspect of the third platform, and that's big data. Now, I'm really not going to talk much about big data today, but I did want to just give you a, 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 an indication of where organizations are at from one specific perspective. And so we gave them a very simple question, and we said, okay, uh, is your infrastructure ready for big data? And by ready, we had them define what ready is, right? And so ready, they said, is performance, and ready, they said, is scalability. Right, okay, so that's good. Um, and then we said, so are you ready? And they said, no, uh, no we're not. So if the line of business comes and says, hey, can you run this project for me? They'll say, well, I'm probably not. I'm not going to be able to do that for you. Unless maybe I can reach out to the cloud and I can pull in some services from there. Or maybe you need to spin up some more budget and help me do things from that perspective. So what I want to talk about is some of the ways to think about how we get towards um, um, be able to shift this uh, in the other direction, right? So that we can say, oh, instead of saying, well, no, I can't really do that, how can we say yes? Another way to look at that is we, we measure Canadian organizations from many different perspectives, right? From their business metrics all the way into the IT department. And there's like many, many uh, dozens and dozens of different metrics that we use to track Canadian firms and see how they're doing. So we rolled it all up and measured it keeping the lights on versus innovation. Well, what's keeping the lights on? That's just patching and updating and configuring of you know application database server storage networking um, and innovation is really being able to learn a new skill or refine a process or it's being able to launch a new project what happened last year is that we actually went the, the wrong way we've spent two additional weeks keeping the lights on in IT rather than getting to the innovative stuff when we all when we netted it all out uh, and measured how we were doing so it's kind of going a, a little bit in the wrong direction so we want to be able to move that back uh, forward. In fact, we asked another very simple question. We said, okay, well, from an infrastructure perspective, from software-defined data center to private cloud to being able just to look at basic automation and orchestration, where are you at? And they're saying, well, we're still a little bit behind the curve, and we know we need to catch up. And I would agree with that, because one of the things I'm going to talk about is 
looking at the architecture of the future from a horizontal standpoint, which I've already mentioned, which is out from you know, on-prem into the cloud, so I've got my horizontal view, but I've also got a vertical view, which is from my network all the way up to my application layer, what are the things I'm going to think about in order to be able to enable my organization of the future such that um, I can get to the organization that I want and I can say, oh, sure, I can run that big data project for you, that's not going to be a problem. Another reason why we want to take a step back and look inside our organization and figure things out is because still most of what we do is on-prem, right? Yes, the hyper growth in Canada is around the cloud and we're spinning up servers in an IaaS environment more so than we are on-prem now. In fact, infrastructure as a service alone in Canada is going to be billion dollar industry by 2019. Um, however, when we think about the basic functionality that all of us use on a daily basis within our organizations, most of that is still on-prem. Right? So what we want to be able to do is get those um, operations, et cetera, really in order and then be able to extend that out into the cloud because the good stuff goes out there and the bad stuff goes out there as well, especially as we extend into a PaaS and IaaS type of environment. So what we've seen over time is that we've done a really good job in this country of getting our hardware, our CapEx, in order, but um, we haven't done such a good job from an OpEx perspective. So in terms of the CapEx, really it's actually been a free ride. Um, as we've heavily virtualized, um, we've been able to uh, increase the amount of VM densities on, on our various uh, servers and in the storage environment, etc. And what that's given us um, is much higher utilization and efficiency rates on the processor and in our storage arrays than we ever had before. Right? Remember we used to have like 5, 10% processor utilization rates and 10%, 20% maybe storage utilization and we've certainly increased that pretty dramatically over time. Um, what we still need to do is be able to improve what we've done from, from an ops standpoint in order to be able to, um, to, to reduce that cost. Because again, well over 70, about 73 cents of every dollar goes just towards doing some of the basics of, of managing uh, the server storage network type of environment. Now, we have increased the VM density fairly significantly, and so that's, again, it's both helped us and hurt us. Um, we've got the average now of 12 VMs on a box. And I know some of you might be thinking, 12 VMs? I've got dozens. I've got hundreds of VMs on a server. Uh, but that's the average across Canada. Um, what we also see is more activity happening between hypervisors, and so we see more movement of workloads happening, both within the data center and then the data center uh, into the cloud. And whether it's a hypervisor or a container, um, we can have that discussion as well. But more of the east-west traffic is starting to happen as we start to reconsider the north-south topology of our networks. Um, and then that's leading towards us looking at software-defined data centers, software-defined networking, software-defined storage, and abstracting our data plane from our control planes such that we can basically start to treat the network or storage environment as more of a service um, rather than something that, uh, that we treat in sort of the manual way that we do. And as a service, it can be something that's, that's um, the attributes are security related Related, the attributes are performance related or what have you, and then we can uh, use that as a way to be able to um, assign it to given applications or what have you. But as we start to deal with things, even in the L2, L3 layer, um, layers, we're able to then uh, uh, use that to be able to extend our environment into a hybrid IT type of environment, right? Now, we ask organizations about manual versus automated tasks and what they're doing. And what we find is about twice as much of our time here in this country is still spent on manual tasks versus the automated stuff. And we've been talking about this for quite a while, um, which is, um, again, trying to reduce the amount of time that we spent on just configuring a database, configuring the application layer to the database, to the server, to you know how much storage I'm going to use and all that good stuff, and be able to um, do things more around the automation phase. And that really gets us into the world of DevOps. Um, and also, we could call it XOps, right? So admins being able to use the same type of tool sets in order to be able to spin things up and spin things down more quickly, in order to be able to do automatic configuration more quickly and that kind of thing. So, why do we want to do that, or how are we going to start to do that, is through some of the open source tools that we're seeing. So whether that's Ansible, uh, so tools like Ansible, or Chef, and Puppet, and Vagrant, and all the tools, depending on what your use cases are, what we see right now is we've got about 1 in 10 Canadian organizations who are there today, who say, yeah, I get it, I'm using these tools, this is good. Um, then we've got about another sort of third plus of the environment that's saying, yes, I, I want to I kick the tires, I want to figure out what's going on there.
So the tools is one part of it. We're also going to talk a little bit about process, because process is also a part of what needs to happen in order to be able to change, to be able to move things more quickly uh, within the organization. Um, now, these tools are overlap between cloud um, and between uh, what's happening from a, a, an orchestration perspective as well. I mean, we take something like OpenStack, of course, there's many different projects within OpenStack. Right? There's everything from you know, things like Neutron and Keystone and Heat that will help you with you know, software-defined networking or identity management or orchestration, respectively. Um, but then we've got other tools uh, like Docker that helps you from a container standpoint. Uh, and then again, things like Chef that help you describe what, what's, the, uh, uh, what's the recipe of how I'm going to launch a given application with given configurations on this hypervisor and that sort of thing. And that's just one example. There's so many other tools. These are just examples of the tools that are out there. And again, we've tracked organizations across many of these different uh, uh, tool environments. So I'm happy to say that we are seeing it starting to increase. So your peers across Canada are saying, yes, OK, this makes sense. I'm going to start to go in that direction. Now, why they're saying that is a couple different reasons. So one is that um, be able to get to that higher level of agility. So remember back at the very beginning, I mentioned that the number one challenge that Canadian organization executives have with the IT department is the ability to adapt and to change quickly. Right? So what they're saying is the number one thing that I'm looking at, things like SDN uh, and these, also these tool sets, is because I want to be able to get to a higher level of agility. I also want to get to more of a service-oriented na uh, nature, and I don't mean service-oriented architecture a la the application stack, although we start to get into that conversation when we start talking about microservices, but uh, service-oriented when we talk about the network itself and storage itself and that kind of thing, and starting to think about that fundamentally differently than we have. Notice where CapEx is on that list. right? And the capex is actually farther down. Most organizations in this country aren't saying, OK, it's about reducing my hardware footprint and that kind of thing, and about pulling the switches and routers out of my organization and going white box with, um, you know, with software on top of it. But rather, it's more about being able to get to that faster level of agility and that kind of thing uh, that organizations are looking at. OK, so one of the things we should be considering is, and by the way, I'm just uh, by way of example showing uh, the, the network admin work week. I can show this by the server admins work week or developers or whatever that is. But let's start at the bottom of the stack. Um, and so this is the average work week of a Canadian admin. Um, this is how they spend their days, how they spend their days of the week. Now, we could have an interesting, uh, very interesting argument or discussion around what should the mix of days look like? Am I spending too little time on security and too much time on troubleshooting and that kind of thing? But one of the things that I wanted to take away from it is what we want to actually do is crush this week down a little bit, take it down to maybe it's you know Monday to Wednesday we do all this, or maybe it's before lunchtime on Monday we do all this um, in an ideal world. So it's really being able to look at that week and start to crush it down, which then winds up leading to the question that I often get after that, which is, OK, if I start to automate away some of these tasks, what then happens to my job if I've basically taken four days out of the week? Don't they only need me for one day or two days or whatever that looks like? But what we find, actually, is that the rising tide lifts all boats, and that the more we actually do automation, the more work we actually wind up creating. Um, and we can see that in ev the, you know, everything that we do in our lives. Remember we were promised the 20-hour work week years and years ago? Um, and now we're at, you know, we continue to grow our work weeks, not shrink, and we've got more and more automation. Plus, we do have a skills gap in Canada, uh, and that's a little bit of a challenge as well. So the more we can shrink this down, the more we can get to that big data project that we couldn't get to before um, and be able to, uh, and, and again, maybe your organization doesn't care about big data, maybe you're not going in that direction, but again, it's about whatever Whatever that project is in your organization, it's being able to shorten that back down to, uh, to be able to improve what's happening there. So one of the things we do is we measure organizations across many different areas um, of their data center and of the IT environment and figure out how they're doing from mean time to repair perspective, mean time between failure, all the way to change quality and staff efficiency and hardware efficiency and that kind of thing. So what we want to start to do is get away from the unplanned work that we're all doing and get more to the planned side of things. It's like 
on any given day, all of us have an inbox full of stuff or phone calls that are coming in that we have to deal with. So a lot of unplanned stuff that keeps us from getting to the planned things. The challenge with that is that if we can get to the stuff that's the planned things, like change quality, staff efficiency, and that sort of thing, it actually reduces the amount of time we spend on the unplanned stuff. If I can give you a, a little bit of homework, some interesting reading, uh, if you'd like, one of them is um, uh, Stephen Covey in The Seven Habits. You don't have to read the whole seven habits. I won't torture you with that. But, um, but if you read uh, habit number three, he talks about getting from um, unplanned to planned work. And how do we do that? Right? How do we reduce our amount of time? It's really uh, interesting and useful. It has nothing to do with tech in, in how he writes it, but it helps in terms of ideas and that sort of thing. Now, if uh, if we want to then apply it down to the technology level, um, I assume a number of you have read uh, Gene Kim's Phoenix Project, yes? Yeah, <laughs> some, some almost read it, uh, a couple nods, it's good. Um, so, so the Phoenix Project is a way to also be able to look at what's the work in progress within my IT department, how do I remove constraints within the department, how do I start to accelerate um, the activity such that when I look at that work week that I can start to reduce that overall, I can start to reduce the time on some of those things that I'm doing so that I can take the things that are up in this top area. So what I ultimately want to do is get to the important versus the urgent, because I'm normally just dealing with the things that are urgent, which again is the unplanned stuff. And I want to be able to get to the things um, that are more important, again, by getting to those things on the more important side. So things like portfolio management as an example. right? And what's portfolio management, but just being able to um, determine what's the order of priority when I'm going to deploy given projects based on things like ROI and other types of metrics. Right? And there's different ways to view this. So for example, you can view it from a security standpoint. Right? Um, very similar type. And by the way, this is all of Canada mapped out in terms of what our security maturity looks like. Um, and it's actually sorted in order from our denialist, um, uh, sorry, defeatist all the way to the egoist uh, in terms of the amount of breaches that they suffer and the size of those breaches. Um, and so really interesting things come out here. As an example, our denialists uh, wind up spending uh, more than the realists, and yet they suffer more breaches. Our denialists actually spend more than our egoists and suffer far more breaches than they do. Um, so how is that the case? That one uh, IT environment can outspend the other and really not do very well uh, from a security perspective. Um, and what it comes down to is really around the operations side of things. Just like I was saying on the, the, the previous chart, which is looking at trying to improve things from an ops standpoint, that's predominantly what this is about. What the denialists actually do is a really good job of understanding the technology side. right? So they can tell you about the latest, greatest firewall, SIM solution, uh, enterprise mobile management, what have you. But they're less good about things like the risk management side, which is essentially just determining what's the probability and impact of a given asset, what's the value of that asset, Asset, and then what order of priority do I want to deploy the different controls that I get to defend that asset from a given threat? Right? So it's pretty simple math. It's basically just getting out and doing it, which can be a challenge because, again, we're spending our time keeping the lights on. Another thing that, uh, just by way of, uh, just to, to, to complete the, the thought around what they're doing well and not doing well, um, is that, so risk management is definitely one of the areas. Uh, training, employee training is also one of the areas that uh, the realists and the egos do really well. Plus, they're actually doing really good recruitment. Um, so they're involved with Canadian colleges and universities. They're involved with you know, user groups and that kind of thing. They're coming out to events like this today and that sort of thing. And being able to really recruit uh, good talent is another one that separates it out. But again, what separates out the folk on one side from the other is those who are able to do more of the planned stuff so they were taking the time, taking the step back, doing the risk management process, and then working their way forward. It wasn't necessarily about how much they were spending, but it was really how they were spending that dollar and how they're allocating it. If you want more deep dive into how they're allocating, according to me afterwards, it'll give you a sense of where all the budget goes from that perspective. But when we look at what's happening more broadly, just coming back up more broadly in the IT environment, things are absolutely not getting any easier. We've got a lot more users who are using technology all the time as, again, they spend more on 
their own technology than clothing in this country, um, across the line of business who are getting more antsy every day about wanting the latest, greatest technology in themselves using their credit card to get something from a software as a service environment. Um, and then on the other side, we've got things from this horizontal standpoint, from on-prem out into the cloud, we've got all those different options available to us. And we still need to look at things from the network all the way up to the application layer. Plus, we've also got um, looking at things from our users having access to the data or applications or what have you um, on a, a desktop environment or all the way to a, to a mobile uh, type of environment as well. So lots of different uh, options available. And this is all interrelated and all very interdependent. That if I solve things at one layer, so if I start to solve things at the network layer, I actually make my life easier in another layer. So for example, if we take storage as an example, um, I've got a lot of different options. So I've got solid state disk, I've got uh, fast spinning disk, slower spinning disk, infrastructure as a service, all these different things that I can start to allocate um, my data across. Um, and then I look at uh, how I'm going to start to do that. I'm going to start to do it by looking at things like the recovery time, recovery point objective, and you look at performance and security and a range of different things that are good to consider. But if I haven't been able to take that step back and, and determine you know, things like data classification and that sort of thing, then it's going to be far more difficult to know, okay, should this go out into the IaaS environment or PaaS environment? Or should this stay on-prem? Or what should I be doing with this? What's the optimal cost uh, for where this data could sit? And what's the skill set? that I have in-house in order to be able to manage those different environments, one versus the other. Right? So this is just an example of, again, all the layers that I really should be looking at in order to be able to um, get to that horizontal ideal architecture and then from that vertical architecture as well. And it's also about the people. Right? Um, one of the things we've been finding is that um, admins in Canada in particular are saying, I'm, I'm really not, just not sure what my job is going to look like in the next couple of years. Again, because we as organizations haven't taken a step back and said, okay, well, this is what we're going to be doing. This is our architecture of the future. Now, that comes back to the line of business having said, this is what our business demands. This is what we need from a business standpoint. This is how we believe digital transformation is going to be impacting our business. Um, and that's done alongside with IT. And then IT can then say, okay, and by the way, here's what your job is going to look like because here's how we're going to architect across these different environments. Right? Because digital transformation is about, again, including the mobility piece, cloud, big data, uh, and social as well, and, and ideally combining those pieces, which you can see in companies like, you know, just to, to beat on the Uber example, just because we all know it so well, is that, you know, when I hail a taxi, I'm using my mobile phone that's connected to the cloud, they're assigning cars to me based on, um, uh, based on traffic patterns and that kind of thing is very big data driven and there's a social element that the driver has rated me and I've rated the driver and that kind of thing so it's kind of combining those different elements now all of those don't need to be there for it to be digital transformation or something that involves a third platform at all but certainly there are all those different components okay so let me um, close off on three points and maybe we might have a, a couple minutes for questions and we'll have to see if we do um, number one is let's uh, fill fast Right, one of the things I've noticed in Canada is that our um, application deployment time is still pretty long. So we average about seven months in this country on average from start to finish. Um, really slow, right? So what we need to be doing is getting to more of a continuous development cycle. So instead of the Big Bang approach is getting towards more of the agile programming. Nothing new there, right? We've been hearing about agile for well over a decade. But we need to start to move in that direction. How do we get there? Well, we start to consider things again from that plan versus the unplanned way and the more that we can start to remove some of the constraints in our IT environment um, by doing things like reducing the amount of time we spend on mean time to prepare mean time between failure and that sort of thing the better off we're going to be in terms of being able to reduce that amount of time in that seven months the number two is really being able to look at things again from that horizontal versus the vertical standpoint they're all interrelated and the more that I can take that step back and start to architect that forward um, the better off we're going to be doing again more we can say about um, about that. Uh, and then finally is, is making the plan. And so, you know, we've actually found that organizations who can take a step back and take a maturity approach as an example. So 
uh, those of you familiar with capability maturity model or whatever the maturity model might be, you, know, you start at stage one and you work your way to stage two, stage three, et cetera, and you're lo looking at that from a process standpoint, from a people standpoint, technology, et cetera, and you're basically advancing the organization forward um, over a multi-year uh, phase. What we found is that organizations in this country that actually do that, even if it's the back of a napkin, right, they've done it some kind of approach, um, do much better in terms of application deployment time, but also in terms of revenue growth. Right? And so I often get the question, well, okay, so if they're growing faster from a revenue growth perspective, is that because you know, IT has been able to take what they've created and make more of a service out of it and they're reselling that service? Often we see that that's not the case, but what, what's happened, again, is that they've been able to um, reallocate um, some of their time and they, they have the ability to be able to uh, launch the projects or refine the, the features or functions or what have you that the business is doing. So they're just faster at being able to churn things through their environment than, other, than their peer organizations are, and that winds up leading towards faster revenue growth from a business standpoint. Again, that's across hundreds of organizations that we track here in Canada, and we track them over time just to see how that's going, um, and you can measure that that's, uh, that's, that's working for them. So I know there's a, <laughs> there's a lot to chew on. Um, I do look forward to interacting with you guys on an individual basis as well and answering your questions individually specific to your organization. Um, I'm going to pause there and see, uh, see Luke if we have time for questions or how you want to do this. For question, absolutely. Oh, that would be great. Cool. Any questions? I mean, David talked about a lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> really busy, uh, you know, 35 minutes of uh, throwing a lot of data points at yeah. us across the country. Yeah. One thing is clear is um, many of the challenges that David referred to Red Hat can address on your behalf, specifically around DevOps automations. We have great solution to help you to get to the next step into your environment. Also, another data point that I find out, IDC conducted a, a research for, for SAP a few months ago and interviewed 200 of the top customers in Canada and 17% has a digital strategy. And 65% says they need to have one. So there's a big gap for you to put the plan together in order to move into the di digital strategy that you're, you're trying to get to. So another data point that we are behind in Canada in getting that done. Yeah, no, it, it's true. I mean, there's definitely ways that we can start to catch up uh, to what some of our peers are doing uh, in, in other regions, for sure. Uh, and we've seen that, though. I, I am proud uh, of Canada, though, in terms of areas that we've been improving on, areas like big data, areas like adopting some of the DevOps type of practices and tools. So we are seeing that there's that positive momentum. So I think there's some really good news there. It's just we need to accelerate that even more. It's very interesting. Over three years since we've been doing this show together, yeah. the evolution of Canadian uh, Making, it's, I mean, the needle it's fantastic. It's, it's fantastic. fantastic. Very fast. Like, we've seen big data projects doubling this year, or seeing them reach out into paths because that's an extension. How quickly you can then say geolocate around Montreal and determine why customers are leaving your brand and going to another brand and that kind of thing. That's available. And you can use your customer data on prem, marry that up with what's available in the cloud and do that very quickly. And we see firms starting to do that. So that's exciting. Anybody? Okay. Or they didn't need more coffee. Right here. <laughs> Maybe you can. Um, so as you mentioned, <clears throat> the trend is about uh, seven month deployment uh, for Canada. What's the global average and what's above average? Yeah, so we see it being as fast as, um, <laughs> depends on the project really. Um, so you asked a really good question that would take me actually a little bit to unpack because it's about several, it's a function of several different things. What's the size of the project, um, the size of the company and that kind of thing. But you can see it anywhere from a couple weeks all the way to, you know, a year and a half plus, right? So there's a huge standard deviation in terms of what that looks like across where that average is. Um, you know, ultimately we want to be much faster Faster. Like we would want to be at least, you know, maybe in the month or a couple of weeks or what have you type of range. Even that would be extensive. I'm sure, Luke, and what you guys see is organizations who do things in a matter of, of a week or less. It depends on, again, what they're doing, what the project is, and that sort of thing. But we're seeing some really rapid. And it's also, remember, that's also the Big Bang approach, right? So. When I'm talking about you know, doing something in a week or, or whatever, I'm talking about just launching a, 
a new feature on top of what's already there, right? Or continuing to develop something as opposed to having that big bang type of approach. Because um, the seven months is, I, I build it all up, I wait, I wait, I wait, and then I bang, here, you have it. And then the, then the organization gets to react and say, ooh, that wasn't exactly what I was looking for. So now, okay, now we're going back to the table, as opposed to it being kind of that continuous flow. In our account base, we see a transition from uh, legacy to new uh, takes in a word between uh, six to 18 months. So it's, uh, it's yeah. uh, certainly longer than seven months in most cases, yeah. but it takes some time to digest, train the people, bring this new skill set, and be able to implement the technology and maximize the uh, reliability and the effic efficiencies of it. Yeah, and I'm talking about just the application layer. If you're talking about sort of doing a migration off the stack, yeah, absolutely, you're talking about more time. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, David. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right.